GPT-5 is probably one of the most disappointing releases I've ever seen in the AI space. And I know, being a creator on YouTube, I have all the incentive in the world to hop this wave and trend and tell you how awesome it is and how it changes everything and how it's insane. This video isn't going to be my typical and normal tutorial style where I go into ChatGPT and tell you all the amazing use cases that you can use it for. Instead, I'm gonna walk you through my thinking as to why I think this is actually more harmful for building AI products rather than helpful. Now, I'm one of the first people to say how excited I was for this new release because it's been hyped for almost years now. And being someone who's literally a practitioner who advises tons of clients through my agency prompt advisors and leads a community of over 500 folks who are entrepreneurs and business owners, I was looking for GPT-5 to actually help a lot of folks better understand how to use AI, make it as easy as possible, remove a lot of the AI slop factor, and most importantly, lead to more accurate and predictable results. But what I was selfishly hoping that GPT-5 would allow us to have is some form of video upload feature. Because this is something that I've been using a lot with Google AI Studio, with the Gemini models, and for me, this has changed a lot, where I can screen record a process. I can basically leave a loom going for 30 minutes, walking through what I do day to day, and try to find ways to automate what I'm doing, or at least delegate and leverage it. Not to mention for other scenarios, like being able to screen record N8N or make.com, and have it help me troubleshoot what might be happening, I thought that this would be an automatic feature that we'd be able to see with a brand new modality that you could interface with with a language model. Instead of that, it really feels like we got some form of additional iPhone. And yes, I made this image on purpose because the way I've been seeing a lot of these releases, especially with OpenAI, is we go from a good model to a good er model and a slightly better model than that, and we keep going down the spectrum. But to me, I actually loved the flexibility of being able to change models and get acquainted with which model was a specialist at what skill set. Now, immediately, you might disagree with me and say, Mark, it's unbelievably overwhelming to remember which model to use for when, which is totally understandable. And if you're not using it as religiously as I've been using for the last two and a half years, I totally understand your perspective. But when I realistically look at the improvements of GPT-5, yes, there is some more stability. Yes, sometimes it can be faster. And yes, it makes it easier to just type a prompt and only worry about the prompt and less so about what's happening behind the curtain. But the thing is, in terms of what's actually changed, we don't really have a core confirmation of all of the language model nuances happening behind the scenes. So for the average user, it, it kind of looks like an iPhone release where you have a better camera, you have a longer battery, in this case, a longer context window. And the analogy kind of feels like as we keep going from model to model, the language model, the transformer base of these models is hitting a wall where to compensate for hitting a wall, we have to add bells and whistles. In this case, being able to change the color of the bubbles in your chat GPT or being even better at math or even better at creating images. But by becoming even more dependent on chat GPT or OpenAI thinking for us in terms of what level of intelligence is needed for a particular task, we enter a new territory. And it's not one that I recommend for a lot of folks that are not as used to using OpenAI or language models in general. When you now send a request to ChatGPT5, it will send it or route it to any one of the existing models they have behind the scenes. And it will decide, okay, based on this query, it seems like this should be an O3. But the issue is, as time progresses, you're going to probably notice that it's going to use 4.0 a lot of the time. And some of that is not just because it's faster or it's deemed that it's good enough, but there could be some ulterior motives there as well. So it's no secret that compute is the name of the game when it comes to these language model companies. And the less they have to worry about in terms of inference costs, and in plain English, what inference costs means is pretty much how much it costs them to be able to serve the model for people like you and I to be able to hammer ChatGPT with as many requests as we want. And one thing that is totally imaginable and within the realm of possibility is that a lot of our requests start getting routed to 4.0 under the guise of this super smart, omnipotent GPT-5 model. And while GPT-4.0 could be the solution, it's totally possible that they keep routing as many requests as possible because it's way cheaper for them, but you're still paying the same cost for your plus and pro plans, which is probably also one of the reasons why they offered it on the free plan because they'll probably send as many requests as possible to 4.0 and it's obviously a way to extract more data 
from users to be able to train the models and create new data instead of using more and more synthetic data to train their models. So without even using it for more than 24 hours, I immediately went to my settings and looked for some form of toggle, which thankfully there was, to be able to show the legacy models. So now I don't just see GPT-5 or Thinking or Pro, but you can see all of these older models as well. For how long that'll be, I'm not sure, but while I have them, I still want to use them. And if you're managing a business, a pipeline of automations, or day-to-day -day workflows that you're immediately by default, given all the hype on YouTube, immediately switching to GPT-5, I'd recommend you actually probably start and stay with what you have in terms of the older models until you better understand the rhythm and cadence and flow of GPT-5. And one thing about language models is that even if there's a slight difference in the model, the way you prompt it, the way it's actually structured, and its core skill set will change. And just to give you an example, if you use 4.0, it's a pretty good generic evergreen model. But if you wanted something that's really good at analyzing an image, you might use 0.3, but the best one at least before was 0.4. And while again, you might not want to remember this, having the ability to at least pick the specific employee in this case to handle the task is a lot better than just kind of saying, I'm feeling lucky, please take this request and route it to wherever you think is best. Because under that line of thinking, we're always going to be assuming that the company owning these models is always gonna act in our best interest, money aside and profit aside and compute aside. So while a lot of what I'm saying could be speculation, I like to be realistic about what it looks like to use language models in a world where a platform has 700 million plus users. And to extend the analogy, you can imagine it as someone whispering the same message to four, or in this case, five different ears. Each ear can hear the message, but the way it listens to the message, the way it converts that message into what it thinks needs to be done and how it needs to be done and when it needs to be done is gonna be wildly different depending on the model that your query ends up at. And if you extend that analogy, if you have an entire pipeline, you might have gone this morning and switched all your make.com or Zapier or n n workflows to GPT-5 Nano or Mini, thinking that you're now using the best intelligence at the lowest cost for that intelligence. And I already see some YouTube videos claiming that Cursor has now re-killed Claude Code and next week Claude Code will re-murder Cursor and this will keep going on and on. But what matters is you don't wanna be jumping around from model to model or stack to stack. For me, these models are sometimes better so far in testing some of the workflows we've built for clients, etc. but sometimes they're not better. Sometimes they're worse. So until you actually have the time to test your day-to-day -day workflows or testing out your custom GPTs and projects to actually compare side by side, what does it look like for O3 to do it versus GPT-5? One thing you'll find based at least on my testing and my team's testing is that sometimes it will always default to using 4.0 where it's very obvious that you could probably, it should probably use O3 or a more advanced model to handle the task. So am I being a super doomer? Absolutely not. I'm just saying to be very cognizant of taking things at face value, removing all the hype and the noise as much as you possibly can, because this could be a helpful tool in your toolbox, absolutely. And making sure that you're ready and your team is ready is way more important than just using it by default and assuming it's the best out there. Now, I don't usually do talking head videos like this, so it's a bit of a different style for me, but I felt the need to actually communicate it. So if you think this format is helpful to have every once in a while a hot take, with the best interest of you being able to use AI in the best way possible, let me know down in the comments below. And if GPT-5 has truly changed your life completely end to end, not just improved your code, but really made an impact, I'd love to hear that as well. And if you're feeling that this video was a breath of fresh air from your feed full of this changes everything, then maybe check out the first link in the description below in my early AI adopters community. I basically do a daily video saying whether or not something is actually helpful or not, and if it is helpful, how you can use it to basically use AI where it works and use AI where it's the most practical. I'll see you in the next one.